I'd just be happy to open it up to questions and comments so we can have more of a dialogue. But uh, let me briefly uh, just go through, you know, first why I've decided to run it again. Um, I think we all feel that 2012 was uh, a very unfortunate uh, outcome electorally, not just here in New Hampshire, but across the country. Uh, the Republicans you know, did not fare well at all in that election, and there's a whole host of reasons for it. But you're seeing, as a result of that election, um, the, the realities of what happens and the consequences that happen of, a, of an election, uh, both here in Concord uh, and in Washington, D.C. And let me just take Washington for a moment. Uh, in, in the president's uh, beginning second term, we have had serious and significant issues relative to our economy, relative to the growth of uh, the size and scope of the federal government, and the, uh, the conduct of the president and his Democratic Party. And these are challenging issues for the nation. But I will tell you, when you speak with people around in New Hampshire, it's not just Republicans who are frustrated, it's undeclared voters and Democrats, particularly with what's happened with the VA and what's happened with this prisoner exchange. These are issues that are a reflection of the president and of Carol Shea Porter. When you look at the prisoner exchange, Carol Shea Porter supported this prisoner exchange 100% immediately on Saturday and then before getting all the facts, uh, which started to unfold you know, days later, we're starting to realize, uh, I think, the errors of this president and Carol Shea Porter. I think when you look at the VA issue, uh, the fact that this administration and many Democrats were coming to his defense suggesting that they knew nothing about the wait lists. Well, that's inaccurate, it's false. When Eric Shinseki was um, sworn in back in 2009, there was not only transition memos from the, the Bush team to the Obama team on this is an issue that had to be dealt with, but there were internal memos in 2010 to Eric Shinseki saying this is a problem and he was uh, stating he was going to address it. That was in 2010. Four years later, the problem has gotten worse and it appears that they've tried to distract and actually cover up the problem uh, of wait lists. This is the kind of leadership you're getting, our country is getting, from Carol Shea Porter and this president. And beyond the other issues of the Affordable Care Act, the growth of the size and scope of the federal government, the lack of economic progress that we're making in the country, people are frustrated. People want solutions, people want ideas, people want uh, their country back. So, you know, late last year, when Morgan and I talked a little bit about whether I should run again, and I talked to my kids, Colby and Jack, who are now 10 and 9, they're old enough to be part of this conversation, uh, we decided yes. There are lots of reasons for it. Number one, I still have the fire in my belly. Number two, we need good, strong leadership in Washington to right the ship, to bring back economic opportunity, to restrain the size and scope of government to do away with the Affordable Care Act that has decimated families here in New Hampshire, and to stand up for what's right, to try to fix some of the real serious problems that we have seen uh, during this administration's tenure. But there's a longer term issue that we've got to address. When you look at the elections in 2014, there's a possibility and a likelihood that uh, Republicans could win the Senate, which was the goal that we had in 2010, to win the House and the Senate so we could govern as a legislative body in a way that produced good, strong legislation, where the president would then have to make decisions. Is he going to work with Congress, or is he going to be an obstructionist? We didn't quite get that component. We, we won the House, but we didn't win the Senate. Well, we have the opportunity now to win the Senate. I think that will happen. I think you're going to see uh, gains in the House. So that guarantees we've got to work hard to make sure that happens. But for the final two years of the president's tenure, we'll have an opportunity to govern in such a way that requires him to finally listen to the American people based on the results of an election. And there's a lot that we can do in the next two years before the 2016 election presidentials. And then we will decide, based on the public policy decisions that have been made, who will be you know, the next
next president of the United States and can set up the opportunity for economic success uh, and, 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 and job creation in this country. But I ask you very simply, do you think you're getting a good representation from Carol Shea Porter? But then I'd also invite you to ask your friends who might not have the same ideological bet that you have. Ask your friends who are undeclared. And ask your friends who are Democrats. You know, ask them to name three things that Carol Shea Porter has done that's a fair and good reflection of this district. Because as far as I can tell, she hasn't had town hall meetings. She's not publicly uh, available when she comes back to New Hampshire. She's not advocating for anything that uh, is, is, again, needs of the community, needs of the district. And these are all obligations and, and things that you need to do when you are representing uh, a group of people, 700,000 people. And we don't see any of that. As a matter of fact, she had one town hall meeting several months ago, and it was a closed event, for lack of a better term. If you didn't sign up ahead of time, you were not allowed in. That is not a New Hampshire town hall meeting. That is not a New Hampshire town hall meeting. We can disagree with the people that represent us, but when you don't have an opportunity to even communicate with them, you're shut out from the process. And we all know that constituent service, respecting people's different points of view here in New Hampshire is, is part of our value system and certainly part of what we do when we are elected, whether it's at a state level, at a local level, or at a federal level. So I think these are things that are going to become critically important during the campaign between now and November. These are things that will highlight the differences between myself and Carol. Uh, you remember the job fairs we hosted. You remember the, um, the, the manufacturing summits trying to bring business and education institutions together so we can help you know, the youth of New Hampshire. These are things that you can do above and beyond voting in committee hearings and on the House floor in Washington, D.C. You can be a representative to New Hampshire in New Hampshire to try to help those that you represent. And I was criticized by Carol, particularly when I held a job fair for veterans and their families. I was criticized by her for that action, which was shocking to me. Two weeks ago, I was up in Conway doing a downtown business tour. And a woman came up to me and said, you may not remember me, but I have my job today because of the town, uh, because of the job fair you hosted in Conway. She said, I just wanted to thank you for that. Those are things that you can do in the <coughs> office when you hold the office to try to help people who are in need. Those things are critically important. It's not just what you do in Washington. It's how you conduct yourself here in New Hampshire as well. And I don't see <coughs> that proactiveness from her <coughs> office. Beyond the legislative issues that we disagree with her on, and the public policy initiatives. I don't see her coming to New Hampshire every week, doing things specifically here in New Hampshire that are gonna help New Hampshire families. And I think it comes down to what kind of member of Congress do we want? Who do we want representing New Hampshire? Is it somebody who's gonna advocate for Nancy Pelosi and support no matter what this president, no matter how many bad decisions or mistakes he makes? Or do we want somebody who's gonna be a better reflection of this district who will identify when the opposition is doing something wrong and work with those on the other side who will look at common sense solutions for the country. And that's what I've done in different areas of my life as mayor or in business or as a member of Congress and that's what I'll do again and that's why I've decided to run. That's why I've decided to go through this process again. But we don't have much time. We've got to balance our budget. We've got to start reducing the long-term debt. We've got to grow the economy. We've got to rein in Obamacare. We've got to rein in the executive authorities that this president, uh, I think, has, has utilized uh, in, in, in a way that no other president has. And for that, we need good, strong leadership. And we need a Congress that can get things done. And I think if you win the Senate, It'll be a much different scenario down in Washington. We'll have an opportunity to govern and govern in a way that requires the president to listen 
to America because of this election that just that, that will have just occurred. So I'm optimistic about our, our ability to win, and I'm optimistic about our ability to govern. And I'm hopeful for the country that once that does happen, you will start to see that job creation, that growth of the economy, and a fundamental change in how the uh, obligations of the federal government um, are, are utilized. And those are, the, I think, the critical things that we care about here in New Hampshire. Now, for, with that being said, I'd love to just open it up to comments or questions. Yes, sir? Number one, Frank, thanks for being here. Thank you, Senator. Uh, number two, it's not only Flag Day, but it's also the birthday of the United States Army, which happened in 1776. For those of you who weren't there at the time, I just thought I'd bring that up. <laughs> Frank, I, <clears throat> I just have one question for you. Uh, before you get to take Carol Shea Porter on, you have a primary. And I would like to know what differentiates you from your opponent, your main opponent, Mr. Innes. Sure. Can you let us know the yes. difference between you two before you can get to Absolutely. take on Carol Shea? Absolutely. Um, I, I didn't know Dan um, when I heard he was thinking about running. I have now met him, I think, three times. I don't know much. I will be um, direct with you about uh, his positions because uh, there's not much there to consider. Uh, so what I can consider is since he has lived in New Hampshire since 2008, uh, the only thing I really have to go on is how he has voted in elections. And what I can tell you is in 2008, he pulled a presidential, a Democratic presidential ballot. So he either voted for Hillary or for Obama. He voted Democrat in 2010, and in 2012, he publicly supported Jackie Silly for governor, endorsed her, and wrote her a $500 check. And that is the extent of his um, time in campaigning in New Hampshire. And then he didn't change his party affiliation from Democrat to Republican until 2013. Now, what I've said is there are many people who used to be Democrats who have seen the light, but they admit it. And we would welcome anyone in this party who sees the light and says the philosophies of, of, of that party are wrong, the philosophies of our party make more sense. But I haven't heard that from so I need to hear more. It's great to come here and say you're against Obamacare and you're a business person, the, the, the sort of campaign that, uh, comments that he makes. But his short tenure in New Hampshire in how he has voted suggests something very different. So while I don't take any election lightly, uh, we will continue to work very effectively to earn the nomination. Uh, we, every week now, since March, we have uh, released 25 different people from out the district that are endorsing our campaign. We will continue to do that. We uh, announced 125 veterans who are endorsing our campaign two weeks ago, 125 different businesses that have endorsed our campaign. Uh, we are going door to door and making sure that uh, we keep our supporters and grow our supporters. But I think that is the fundamental difference. I'm running in a Republican primary for the Republican nomination against somebody who was a registered Democrat in 2013. Thank you very much, Frank. You're welcome. Other questions? Don't be back. Don't. Yes, sir. Social Security. Keep hearing that that's running out of money. How do we fix it? Yeah, so I was on the budget committee. And uh, the best information that you can gather is from a a political nonpartisan group that would testify in front of the committee about <clears throat> the structure and, and financial viability of Social Security. And we would hear testimony from time to time that, and again, not a Republican, not a Democrat, uh, someone who is ideologically uh, neutral and focusing on, on, on just the facts. And the reality is that Social Security is running out of money, and we've got to shore it up. I believe that we should have Social Security. It's a promise made to uh, our, our Americans, uh, our seniors, and it's a, it's a program that should continue. What you're going to hear from the Democrats, quite frankly, is that Republicans want to get rid of it, which couldn't be farther from the truth, could not be farther from the truth. 
What we are doing is trying to be honest and responsible to the realities of the dollars going in and the dollars going out. And how do we change that scenario to ensure that uh, it, it, is, it is shored up for years to come? So we, depending on the analysis that you use, we're looking at anywhere from 15 to 25 years it goes bankrupt and nothing is done. What I would like to see is members of Congress from both parties put down sort of the political rhetoric and say, let's agree that we all want to keep Social Security, because I think most Americans can agree to that. So then let's find three, three four, five, six solutions uh, that get us to that point. Get it through the House, get it through the Senate, and put it on the President's desk. But you will hear during the political campaign from the National Democratic Party and probably my Democratic opponent that, oh, all the Republicans want to do is get rid of it. It's just, it's, I think it's an old line that I hope is not, um, it, people realize is false. They tried it uh, a few years ago when we were trying to fix uh, Medicare. And it took us, you know, the better part of two years to specifically get our position out because the Democrats framed it as, oh, they just want to get rid of it, which, which is not true. It's just, it's not true. So is it solvable? Yes. Um, I think we can solve it, and I think there's an opportunity. Uh, particularly, I think the next Congress can actually be a bold one. And it would be interesting on how the President wants to define the final two years of his tenure. And if, if, the, if, if, if a Republican House, and if it's a Republican Senate, can put bills in front of the, the, the president on the president's desk that reform all of these structural problems that we're having. It's up to the president to determine how is he going to, to to work with the Congress. And again, the Congress will be an elected will be the latest uh, reflection of the American public's viewpoint. And I would argue if it does go, if the Senate goes Republican. The president's got to take that into consideration and try to get some of these issues done. Bill Clinton did it. George Bush did it. This president so far, I think, has gone more far to the left than ever to the center to try to solve some of Americans' problems. But in this particular issue, I'm hopeful that uh, we can you know, not just take care of the discretionary spending in Washington, but some of the non-discretionary spending. Any other? Uh, else? Yes, please. Can you talk to some of the legislation that you introduced while you were in Congress? So there's two things that I think are important. Number one, I think we don't just judge somebody by the by the legislation they introduce. I think we also try to judge people, uh, particularly um, people who want to reform government and, and reduce the size of government. Let's judge them by how many bills we can repeal. Uh, that's that's important. If you want to restrict the size and scope of government, and you want to make it constitutionally based, we've got to consider where are the areas where the government is overreaching. Now that was challenging because uh, unfortunately when I was in, we could pass anything in the House, and most of it got to Harry Reid's desk and would throw it in the circular file. It was very, very frustrating. Mm -hmm. And the reason he was doing that was to protect his Senate uh, from, from, any, from having to take any tough votes. But the disappointing thing uh, in the time that I spent is, is we got three bills passed the House, the Senate, and signed into law. I did. Um, and most probably nobody knows it. And as I speak, I ask people, do you know that I was able to get three pieces of legislation signed into law? The media, trying to get the media sometimes to communicate what you're doing it is is very difficult, and they weren't. They were they were they were smaller issues, but nonetheless important. The most important uh, that some people may have heard of. We have a, a cemetery in the Philippines <coughs> called Clark Cemetery, which was not being um, <clears throat> taken care of by the Ameri by the federal government. You would think that's a no-brainer. You call up DOD, you figure out who's going to take care of it, and you get it resolved. Well, like many issues, it was, it was far more complicated. So I filed legislation that put the responsibility on the United States government to 
to take. We have American soldiers who are, who are buried there. And to the families of those soldiers, you'd think the least we can do is take proper care of the cemetery. So I filed legislation, uh, testified in front of the Veterans Affairs Committee, uh, moved it through the House, worked with Senator Ayotte to get it moved through the Senate, and we got that bill signed into law by the President. And last December, we, uh, the United States signed the, the agreement with the Philippines to complete that transaction. That's something I'm very proud of. Um, it, it's, it, it's, it's a small bill, but inf important bill, mm -hmm. to veterans and to families who have specific veterans who are, who are buried there. Mm -hmm. Kenny Weiler has a family member who's buried there. There's a direct you know, New Hampshire connection to it. So those, that was one bill. There were two other bills that were transportation related. One that uh, reduced fraud uh, in the trucking industry, <clears throat> which was uh, ended up getting bipartisan support in the House and the Senate, signed into law by the President. And the third was allowing, again, on federal projects. Um, what I con one of the concerns I had was the amount of time it took for a federal project, meaning to, to get approved, and to be complete, which means you're going to spend more dollars on that project. So you only have so many dollars to spend. Here in New Hampshire, we talk about the, the condition of our roads and our bridges. Well, part of what contributes to those problems, when you spend dollars and they're not spent effectively and efficiently, or, or, or decisions are not made quickly, it takes longer and more money. So we were able to um, improve that process by uh, allowing uh, 3D siting on, on federal projects. Which again, sounds like a small issue, but it's, it's saving us millions and millions of dollars on federal projects. So they were, those two were more based on the, com the committee assignments I, I received. The veterans issue was more of a, just a general ref reflection of what I felt was, was an area for veterans that we could, that we could, that we could solve. But the most of the important issue there, and again, compare this to Carol Shea Porter. I was in the minority. I was in the majority in the House, but in the minority in Washington, and I was able to get three bills passed as a freshman, which is really unheard of. Carol Shea Porter, when she was in the majority, couldn't even get one passed through the House. So it, it's also about the effectiveness of your member. It's not just the ideolo ideological positions that you take. Because there are things, there are bipartisan bills that we can work on to improve your constituency, help your constituency, respond to your constituency. Um, so beyond, I think, the ideological differences between Carol and I, there's an effectiveness gap as well. Uh, we were able to get more done in the minority than she was ever able to do while she was in the majority. And I think one of the things that you've got to focus on when you represent people is, well, th there are the larger issues, you know, the economic issues, tax reform, dealing with uh, non-discretionary spending and the big public policy initiatives that we're going to take. But then there are specific things you can do through the committee assignments and the process to work with your constituents and, and, and better uh, respond to your constituents and help you know, the, the nation. There's, other, other, there's more that you can do than just based on the votes that are before you on the House floor. Mm -hmm. I'll give you one, Frank. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Kathy. Feel I'm concerned about the lack of interest that people show in coming out to vote. Mm -hmm. And especially this year, I'm very concerned about that. <clears throat> Any suggestions? Well, uh, look, last... In 2012, we had 100,000 same-day registrants. Um, that's a problem. Because not all of those people were deemed legal residents of the state of New Hampshire. I don't know if you just read in the Union Leader last week, they prosecuted somebody from Massachusetts. Um, this is a problem. You know, it, election reform should be very simple. You have a New Hampshire license, you prove that you're a resident, you can vote. That's a very simple standard. As a matter of fact, when I was mayor of Manchester, I went to go get a library card to promote uh, the use of the public library. 
and Morgan and I, our kids were young, and this was at the point when we needed to, you know, start bringing the kids to the library and take use of the, utilize the, of the, of the services that the libraries have. And when I walked in, the um, person at the desk said, hi, Mr. Mayor, how can we help you? I said, I'd like to sign up for a library card. I'd like your ID. Which is the way it should be. And I said, absolutely, here's my ID. So I, they knew me as the mayor, and they knew I lived in the city, but I had to show an ID. I think it's a very basic standard. We want everyone who's a resident of the state of New Hampshire, we want to encourage them to vote. We just want to make sure you're a resident of the state of New Hampshire. Number one. Number two, um, we need to reach out. Look at what President Obama did when he was running for re-election. He spent, his campaign, spent the better part of two years in New Hampshire knocking on doors, identifying people who were not registered, who they thought were, would, if they did register, would be supporters of, 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 of his reelection. And they didn't know how many people, how many new people would come out, but they exceeded their vote total, total from 08 to 2012. And those are things that we need to be doing um, because it helps everyone on the ticket. If we can find an extra 200 people in Raymond, that's going to help everybody. So th that's something we've got to do a better job at. And encouraging those people, and communicating to those individuals, not just through the course of a campaign, but all year round. And that's something that you know we typically haven't done. I mean, we typically just talk to people about elections during the campaign season. Well, we've got to change that. You know, we've got to be communicating with people uh, on a regular basis all year round, and it's got to be more than just at the Republican committee meetings. So one of the things that I'm encouraging people to do is when you have a conversation starter about the elections, whether it's my race or the U.S. Senate race or the gubernatorial race or a local race, start the conversation with people who you might feel are independent or Democrat and ask them, you know, ask them three things about Maggie. What, what are the three things Maggie Hassan has done to help the state? Ask the same question. I mean, just let them tell you what, you know, if they're supporting someone on the east side. Again, with Carol Shapiro, what are the three things Carol has done to directly help and impact people in the district? I think you'd be hard pressed to find a good answer to that question. And then we start talking about you know, our candidates and the public policy decisions that we offer on tax reform, uh, on, 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 on health care. The, the those are the two issues right now that are on most people's minds beyond you know, um, what sort of pops up like the VA scandal or, or the prisoner exchange. Um, the, the more general and broad issues are, are jobs and economy and, and, and health care. And then whatever pops up, and right now what's popping up is, is you know, the two things that I hear most are VA and, and the prisoner exchange. But if we do that as a, as a as candidates as, 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 and as a party and reach out to those people who should be with us but we don't reach out enough to them, we, we can be very successful. We can energize them. But we've got to, that, that's an area that we need to, to focus on. Okay, I agree. One more quick one, then. Yeah, then I'm going up to Concord to another event, and then I'm trying to catch the talent of my kids' baseball game. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Can I do that one? Uh, <laughs> how, how are you going to get the young people involved? Well, it's a very good question. Um, let's start with a couple facts. When the president was running for re-election in 2012, those people that voted for him in 08 were about to graduate or had graduated. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the sectors of highest unemployment. Kids coming out of college couldn't find a job. So the president had four years to help those individuals, and he couldn't do it. So a lot of those individuals were living at home because they, they couldn't afford to do anything else. Now it's two years later. And I was at an event last evening in Londonderry where a college student asked, said to me, the cost of education is so, of, of college, is so excessive, and my likelihood or ability to find a job 
that pays enough to pay that bill, the gap is too wide. This is coming from an, an existing New Hampshire student. And he's right. So what the president offers is an opportunity to maybe pay, you know, take more taxpayer money and try to incent you that way. That's not the way to incent people to go to college. What we need to do is place, you know, more pressure on the educational institutions to bring down their cost. So anyone of, of, on any socioeconomic level can afford a degree. Now, some of the things we're doing in New Hampshire, I think, are, are, are really fantastic, particularly at the high school level, where we're matching up kids' interests, finding those interests earlier, and giving them opportunity to go into a certain area of expertise. And then they can continue that on through the community system and the four-year degree system in our state. We're doing a better job today than we were 10 years ago of making that connectivity. But we've got to continue to do more of that. Secondly, um, we've always had a bit of a program here in New Hampshire where the larger businesses will help and contribute through like the UNH system, where they will help design a program that's beneficial in engineering or mathematics, uh, a, a, a specific type of engineering depending on the company that needs it. And that company would provide resources. Well, I think that's a great opportunity for you know the business community and the educational community to come together and utilize more than just taxpayer resources. If we have growth in our state, economic growth, where you have more companies coming here and expanding, you're going to have more dollars for those types of relationships, public-private partnerships. But as I just saw last week, the economic growth of the state was 0.9%. And Maggie Hassan was, was, was lauding that as a success. While at the federal level, for Q1, the, the economic growth rate was negative 1. We contracted nationally as an economy in January, February, and March. You can't have that trend and expect and continue to have that trend and expect that you know, kids out of college are going to have an opportunity to go get a job at forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year. It's just, it's just not going to happen. So it's vitally important that we change the public policies around taxation, economic growth, and spending so we can you know, have better opportunities uh, once those public policy positions are in place. And that goes not just for the federal level, but for the state level. But you're not, what you saw at the state level, are, you know, the argument was, should there or should there not be more taxpayer-funded dollars going to the university system? That was the extent of the conversation. The conversation should be, before we get to that, before we get to it, we're going to ask taxpayers for more. We should be talking about how to grow the economy to have more resources available, more financial resources, both in the private sector and in the public sector. The same thing with the gas tax. The gas tax question in New Hampshire was positioned as, we need to raise the gas tax because our roads and bridges are crumbling. I would argue, if you had an economic growth plan under this governor and the last governor that had four, five percent growth model, in this state, you never would have had to raise the gas tax. Never, it would, never would have been a question. We need leaders who are going to focus on growth because growth means more revenue to the Treasury. And then our elected officials can then determine how do you utilize those dollars. And maybe you put some into transportation, and maybe, guess what? You lower the property tax rate and give people back some of that money because of growth. But the conversation in Concord and in Washington is how can we take more from the taxpayer based on a certain set of needs when the conversation should be driven by if we have growth and reform in these areas, how can we have an explosive economy that will benefit not just the public sector but the private sector as well and the opportunities for people to get a, a good paying job. Think about the number of people who are no longer looking for work because they were looking for so long that they couldn't find a job. That's why the unemployment rate is coming down. 
it's not because you have an explosive job growth. It's because more and more people can't find a, a job and they stop looking and they're no longer counted in that unemployment number. And you see that at the federal level and you're seeing it here on the state level. And that concerns me as I'm 43, our kids are 10 and 9. You know, they're not obviously in the workforce yet, but as I look at high school kids going into college and college kids graduating, do we want those kids to stay here in New Hampshire? Absolutely. But if the job opportunities aren't here, they're going to move elsewhere. And that's a long-term problem for our state that's not being addressed. So to me, it starts with economic growth, uh, tax policy change, the tightening your belt and, and being restrictive on your spending. I mean, we are a low-spending state. But we have been in the past. We haven't been of late, of late. But we need to be a low-spending state. Cost of government should be low. Cost of doing business should be low. We have to be far more effective um, against the other states in terms of what our tax situation is. I mean, we think of no income and no sales. That's great. I love it. But our business taxes are amongst the highest in the nation. So when you're an executive <coughs> team that's looking at, do I move to South Carolina, Virginia, Texas, Indiana, or New Hampshire? New Hampshire is always on the bottom of the list because energy costs, uh, costs of doing business, meaning your your taxes, health care, and a lack of a skilled workforce puts us at the lower end of the list compared to those other states. We get more competitive in those areas and you will see more companies wanting to move to New Hampshire. I mean, don't get, I love New Hampshire. It's a great place to work and, and live and, 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 uh, and raise a family. But we also have to be cognizant of the numbers and how we stack up. And right now we're in the middle of the pack. You know, we're about 26, 27 amongst the 50 states. Which is saying you got to be in the top 10 to be considered. So that's an area of where I wish you know our 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 governor would focus more attention. Well, we're going to yeah. Turkey. We're all set. That's right. Well, I, I did see that. <laughs> um, you know that 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 trip, in my view, isn't going to produce. Uh, it's not going to change one company's decision. Who, if they have it. South Carolina, Texas, and New Hampshire, that trip to Turkey is not going to make one bit of difference on a decision for a company to, to choose New Hampshire right now. You can have relationships with countries on your export-import without having to travel there on a regular basis. Well, you know what the Dems answer was why the first quarter was in negative growth in terms of national, because the winter was so cold. Yeah, I've heard that. Um, you know, look. I think it's a pretty weak response. <laughs> so did I. To, to why, I mean, you know, every other, I, I, I don't remember a winter in New England ever being warm. <laughs> and we've had positive economic growth during those quarters in the past. So there's probably something else going on here. I mean, maybe it's the regulatory <laughs> compliance requirements. Maybe it's the fact that businesses don't know what tax policy is going to be because after the last tax increase that the president wanted, and three months later they started advocating for more tax increases. You know, maybe it's because Obamacare is decimating small businesses in the state of New Hampshire. But they ignore, you know, those public policy realities and try to blame it on something else. And you know, look, you need serious leaders who are going to make real strong decisions. The Affordable Care Act, you look at it. And you say we had 22,000 people who lost their insurance. How many people did we have signed up now? I think it's exceeded 22,000 in the state. But it's a, it's been a it's been a shuffle game. Mm -hmm. And it's and when you go talk to a benefits company, they'll tell you that 90% of the companies they represent are having increased premiums in a year when the president was pushing off some of the mandates. Wait until next year when the new rates come out October 1st. The rates come out October 1st, all the top CEOs of the, of the, of the insurance carrier said all the rates are going to be going up. Now we're going to find those out, those increases out on October 1st. But you watch, the president will try to figure out a way to make, to move off that, that date to after the election. It's all political. It's all political. 
And by the way, the Affordable Care Act is just is, is a step towards single payer system, which, you know, again, what, what we need in New Hampshire, we need more carriers in the state. And this started with community rating, and Senator Barnes was in the Senate, you know, fighting, fighting this, um, fighting the good fight, but unfortunately he was in a losing, in a losing battle in trying to fundamentally change how rating is set in the state. That's what was driving carriers out. And you can bring carriers back in who will provide uh, coverage throughout the entire state if we just change that. But you know, there's no interest right now in the state house or, or, or uh, by our governor to do that. Well, we'll work on changing that. Well, and we can. I mean, you know, we look again. You elect the right people at the state level, and you can make great changes. I mean, I, look, portability is an important issue to people. I mean, if you move from Texas to New Hampshire, you should have portability with your health insurance. You should be able to bring, just like with your car insurance, you should be able to port it from one place to the other. I've advocated for a regional portability um, program, where just New England. Let's use New England as a regional, instead of just New Hampshire, the entire region of New England. Imagine how many carriers would flock to the state, to the, to the region, in order to compete against one another. What does that mean for your premium? They would come down immediately. But that's, that's, this is, again, this is not a Republican principle. This is, this is just basic logic. And I've talked to the, uh, other members of the delegation from other from other states who supported. I've talked to insurance commissioners who supported. I've talked to attorneys general who supported. But you know what the president decided was the Obamacare bill. You know us forcing you to purchase insurance is the way to go. So there's there's lots of things that we've got to do to to try to get us on the right track. Yeah. You talked about the VA system, single payer. Is that what Obamacare is going to be eventually? Is it, are we going to be similar to what's going on in the VA system Well, right now? I, I think that, look, there are those during the Affordable Care Act debate that were advocating for a single payer system. And there are those who are uh, in office who still would like to see a single payer system. Uh, <clears throat> that would be detrimental to access, to affordability, uh, and, and and to follow. So I, I, I hope we never get to a single payer system. Well, what, what is happening with the VA? It's not the doctors that are making decisions. Apparently, it's the bureaucrats. And would it not be the same if Obamacare? Yes, it, it would essentially be the same. But here's one of the problems in the VA. If you if you need an appointment, you know, as it was explained to me by somebody who got a letter saying you have an appointment in three months from now. There's no phone call. It's it's. I mean, it's done. You can't even just pick up the phone and, and set up an appointment. You get a letter that says, "Here's your date," and if you can't make that date, then they'll give you a different date. I mean, the, the months goes by. No wonder why there's a waiting list. I mean, if my if my ten year old daughter needed some sort of medical care, and the only way to get it was for me to write a letter to my doctor requesting a, an appointment, and I have to wait for a letter to come back on what date it was going to be. I mean, that's just not common sense. Frank. Yes, sir. If you get elected, will you back Senator John McCain and what he's trying to do with the VA? Yes. Senator McCain is trying to do is close the VA hospitals and give qualified veterans a card where they can go to any hospital in the country, close the VA system down, as he told me, Jack, a lot of those hospitals are in such tough shape they shouldn't even be open around the country. I'm not talking about you know, the local stuff, but out there in the country. Yeah. And they should be out of business and give the qualified veterans a card that can go to <coughs> any hospital at any time. We can do that right now. Well, that's what we should be doing we, we should, the VA, the heck with the, the hospitals. We should, we should and, and, the, and the uniqueness of New Hampshire is we don't have a full service VA hospital. The only state in the nation. So I would argue that let's start with New Hampshire because of the fact that we don't have the, 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 the full service VA hospital. Every New Hampshire veteran gets a card, whether they live in Conway, Berlin, 
Portsmouth, you got Nashua, it. You got it. and you decide as a veteran where you want to get your care. You're going to sponsor that bill if you yes. get in? Yes, I will. Okay. Yes, I will. <clears throat> yes. Do you have any ideas about how to take all of these young kids, get them off their phones, drag them to the polls, and get them to vote Republican? I'll tell you what. What we need to do is talk to them on their phone. This is this is they're connected to this 24 hours a day, right? So we need to start communicating to them on this. Okay, do you have a way to do it? Yes. Okay. We that do. would be a good thing. And, I mean, again, we need to change how we communicate to a vast group of people. And uh, and there's 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 lots of different things that we're looking at to make sure um, that that we have a better system to communicate not just with the prototypical voter, but the non-traditional voter. And that, that includes you know, our, our younger voters. So I've been on every, just about, I think, every college campus now in the, in the first district, and the, yeah, actually some in the second district too, to talk about some of the things that we need to do differently. So we're organizing a, a team of, of, of college-age folks um, to make sure that, that we've got, that, that we're ready to, to communicate to kids. But again, our, our public policy matches the needs of those of the students. We just have to be more effective in communicating to them. And that's part of you know a, a longer term strategy, a short and long term strategy, to increase the number of people who are going to be coming out and, and supporting our effort. Well that would be good because I see old people all the time. Where are the young ones? We're yeah. sitting right here with the young ones. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks everybody for uh, spending some time with me. I've got to shoot up the conference.